Are y'all ready for chapter 17? Mesopotamia, the summer of 331 BC. Missing charm. When we left Egypt, we took plenty of food with us in the mule carts. The men were in high spirits after Alexander told them what the oracle had said, and our nose bags were full every evening. But I was missing charm, and left most of my barley. It was worse than when she went away after Thebes, because then her smell had lingered in my stall. This time, we were moving on every day, and I, I couldn't find her spring grass scent anywhere as we retraced our hoof prints up the coast to Tyre, and then set out east across the plain to look for King Darius. As soon as we left the coast behind, it grew seriously hot. There were no trees to shade us from the sun, only endless dust that made us cough. When we camped, Tidios tried his best to groom the sweat off me, but he didn't have water to bathe me because we needed every drop we carried to drink. So he had to use his mitten, and I hate my belly being cleaned off that way. After I'd nipped him a few times, he gave up, only to get shouted at by Alexander for not looking after me properly. Poor Tidios. I think he was missing charm, too. Alexander kept her blood-stained scarf twisted around his belt. He fingered it thoughtfully as Potassios and I walked side by side at the front of our huge herd. Do you think my groom was really eaten by a crocodile in Egypt? He asked Hephaestion. His friend gave him a sharp look. Alex, I do believe you're pining for Charmides as much as your horse is. Don't be ridiculous. She's only a groom. So why do you keep looking behind you? Persia's that way. Hephaestion pointed at the shimmering horizon ahead of us. Alexander sighed and took a swig from his water skin. She's not dead, my friend. I feel it. Maybe she ran away again, though I never thought she'd leave Bucephalus. Oh, stop looking at me like that. I only want her back so my horse will start eating again. Look at him, he's wasting away in this heat. At this rate, I'll be riding a skeleton by the time we get to Persia. Hephaestion laughed, making Potassios toss his head. You've got King Darius's wife, who's supposed to be the most beautiful woman in all Persia, and her two marriageable daughters captive in your baggage train, yet you're worrying about that slip of a groom? He gave Alexander an amused look. I should have guessed. She's defied you every step of the way, yet you've never punished her, have you? Not even after that business with the passes at Issus. It's good thing she's gone, if you ask me. Imagine the scandal. The great King Alexander brought to his knees by a slave girl who dresses like a boy. You, of all people, should know it's not like that, Alexander snapped. He paused and looked over his shoulder again. How far do you think I can trust General Parmenio? Hephaestion sobered at once. Are you worried the men won't follow you across the Euphrates? Oh, Parmenio won't try the same trick he did at the Granicus, Alex. Don't worry. He knows if he does, the phalanx will follow you this time, and he'll be the one left on the riverbank with a handful of men to face the enemy. Somehow I doubt he'll come out of it as well as you did. Alexander sat a bit straighter on my back and smiled. You're right there. After all, General Parmenio isn't the son of a god. We walked on a bit, with just the thudding of our hooves and the creak of the men's armor breaking the silence. Hephaestion gave Alexander a sideways look. Did the Siwa Oracle really say you're the son of Zeus? Hephaestion looked unsure. Alexander's eyes glinted. Do you think I'd make something up like that? And is it true the Oracle promised you defeat Darius, reach the edge of the world, and become immortal? Alexander rested a sweaty hand upon my crest and squinted at the horizon. Yes. If you ask me, that was a stupid question. What did Hephaestion expect Alexander to say? No? What about your father's assassination? Alexander stiffened. I need to speak to my mother about that. It was unclear. But you asked the oracle if all King Philip's murderers had been punished, didn't you? Hephaestion pressed. You still haven't told me the story. I'm sorry, you still haven't told me what it said to that. It doesn't matter what the oracle said. Alexander smiled to take the sting out of his words. Don't worry. I'm not going to let anyone slip a knife between my ribs. 
I am the reborn Achilles and the son of Zeus. Remember, when I've won the Persian crown and reached the edge of the world, I'll be a god as well as a king. Then I won't have to worry about my father's murderers, Persian curses, General Parmenio, or anyone else for that matter. He gathered up my reins determinedly. According to the Greek maps, we're getting close to the Euphrates. Take some men on ahead, my friend, and find some boats to bridge the river. I don't want to delay any delay in crossing it. We need to find some shade before the men melt. Macedonians are not made for these temperatures. The land between two rivers. Excuse me, just a second. I have to plug in my charger here. There we go. Hephaestion's bridge of boats shifted under our hooves, upsetting Electra and the other youngsters, so there was a lot of snorting and shouting as we crossed the Euphrates. On the other side, we caught some enemy spies who had come north from their city of Babylon to see what we were up to. There, they were a small herd, easily dominated, and the ones we didn't catch ran away. But Alexander was suspicious and didn't chase them. Threatened by my flat ears and the king's sword, the captured spies soon told us that King Darius's entire army was wading downriver to trap us in a place where the Persians had once dominated the Greeks. The boss of Babylon had orders to retreat before us and burn all the crops so our men would be tired and hungry by the time we got there. Ha! How stupid do they think we are? General Parmenio favored making camp on the West Bank, but Alexander sent an order to the Amazons, who rode at the back of our herd, to burn the bridge behind us so no one could retreat. Then he turned my head into the rising sun, and we continued northeast, away from the river. General Parmenio squealed a bit, but ordered his men to follow us, because he didn't want to fight the Persians himself with only half a herd. The Babylonian herd watched us go in dismay. The land on the east side of the Euphrates is called Mesopotamia. <gasps> Mesopotamia, Jackson, <laughs> which means the land between the rivers. Mostly it was farmland with canals crisscrossing the fields to water the crops. There was wheat to fill our nose bags and trees to shade us from the fierce sun. Only small villages lay on our route. The people either ran away before we got there or begged us not to hurt them and gave us their goats and sheep to feed them in. Since King Darius had not expected us to come this way, there were no soldiers to protect the vulnerable members of his herd from us. Alexander didn't bother dominating them. He treated the people of Mesopotamia like young foals, showing them he was the boss without hurting them because he knew they were no threat. The next river, the Tigris, was shallow enough to cross without swimming. Although the baggage carts got a bit wet and some of the shorter men had to be helped through the deepest parts by their friends, no one minded very much because it was lovely and cool in the water. We caught some more enemy spies and discovered from them that King Darius's army was now camped only about half a day's march away, having rushed across from the Euphrates to stop us marching further east into Persia. Alexander smiled grimly and ordered the men to dig a ditch around the camp and set spikes in it to stop the Persians from attacking us in the night. Then he retired to his pavilion to talk tactics with General Parmenio. Grim gossip for the next three days was all about the coming battle. King Darius's herd is supposed to be bigger than ours. The grooms claim he has a million men and horses. I hope this is not true. We have only 40,000 men and 7,000 horses. That's a lot less than a million. The Amazons say that because of the horse bond, Charm's absence weakens Alexander. So if our grooms are right, we are in a huge amount of trouble. When the moon went out. On the third night, I'm in my normal spot on the horse in the horse lines between Potassios and Borealis. Tidios has gone off with the other grooms. Ever since Charm disappeared in Egypt, he's been drinking so much magic it makes him sick in the mornings. We horses have had no work for the past three days, only lead outs to stretch our legs, so I'm feeling a bit fresh. When Aura nickers to me from the mare's lines, a shiver goes through me. She's coming into full season again, and her dappled summer coat glows beautifully under the full sun. While I'm remembering the last time I managed to run away with a mare, Harpina, back at Halicarnassus, 
The light fades from Aura. Even Zoroaster is getting difficult to see. My coat prickles. The sentries light torches, and one of the men points to the sky and cries, Look! A monster is eating the moon! My coat stands on end. Potassios whinnies nervously. Borealis shifts his backside into me. The sentries stare at the sky and whisper uneasily. They say it is a bad omen before battle. None of them notice a dark-skinned man run across from the hostages' pavilion and steal a bridle. The thief creeps behind the horse lines, bent double to keep out of sight. I whinny a warning that he keeps well away from me. He eyes Zoroaster, but does not dare pass my lashing tail. Instead, he darts over to the mare's lines, where Aura nickers to him like the gentle mare she is. He smiles and puts the bridle on her. The moon has now been fully eaten. It's very dark when the thief scrambles onto Aura's back and heads her out of the lines. He guides her between two stakes, easy because they're pointing the other way to keep enemies out, twists his fingers in her mane and gallops her at the ditch. Hey, shouts one of the sentries, finally realizing something's wrong. One of the Persian queen's slaves is escaping. The trumpet blares the alert call, but too late. Aura, being both well-trained and brave, leaps the ditch and vanishes into the night with a thief. The sentry tosses his spear after her, but it falls short. I whinny wildly after my mare and rear up and try to break my tether, but before I can gallop after her, Prince Aukas races out of the hostage's tent. Charmea, he sobs, his thin face streaked with tears. Where Charmea? I haven't seen Aukas since Egypt, and his smell reminds me of what happened to Charm, which makes me forget Aura. Tidios grabs the man colt and shakes him. Was that one of your slaves who just stole our mare? He was lucky to not get speared. What's your mother thinking of letting him run off like that? The face the prince's face twists. He clenches his face and bursts into tears. My mother's dead, he sobs. Tidio stares at him in confusion. The moon is coming back now, but their faces are still in shadow. The Persian queen's dead? Tidio looks fearfully at the hostages' pavilion. Oh, Zeus, Alexander didn't kill her, did he? Aukas shakes his head again. She gets sick on journey. She died at night. One of her slaves say he go to my father's camp with the news. I tell him to take Zoroaster, but he must get confused. Not hurt him, please. He only slave. He looks pleadingly at the sentries who have gathered around to make sure Aukas does not escape as well. They seem embarrassed by the prince's tears. He's probably in the Persian camp by now, you little eel, grunts one of the sentries. Galloped off on the gray mare like all the devils were after him. Aukas sniffs. <laughs> he get away. Some of the tension runs out of him. Good. He will tell father what happened. Then after battle, father will come and rescue me and my sisters and the granny Sisigambis and Auntie Barcine. One of the sentries takes the prince's arm to escort him back to his pavilion, but Tidia stops him. No, wait. He crouches down so he's level with the man cult. Charmea's gone, Ocus. We haven't seen her since Egypt. General Parmenio thinks she was eaten by a crocodile, but I... His voice cracks, and he continues in a harsher tone. You were in the camp when she disappeared. Did you see her go to the river? Ocus bites his lip, glances at me, then whispers something to Tidios. Tidios's breath comes faster. He grips the man colt's shoulders and says, What did General Parmenio do to her? But Akas shakes his head. I not see. His soldiers take me back to Lady Barcine. I get a spanking because running away not good. Behavior for a prince. Then mother gets sick and Lady Barcine say it my fault because I make her worry so much. But Charmaine not get eaten by a crocodile. She not that silly. Tidios whispers, a little smile playing at the corners of his mouth. I knew it couldn't be true. Charm's still alive. I smell Alexander's sherbet sweetness and nicker to him. Tidios looks around wildly, but there's no time to hide because the king is already striding down the horse lines toward us. The sentries rush back to their posts. The grooms quickly straighten their tunics and swill out their mouths with some of our water. Tidios doesn't get a chance because Aukas is cleaning, clinging to his arm. 
Alexander obviously hasn't slept. There are dark circles under his eyes. Perita, now quite grown up, trots at his heels. But when she smells Aukus, she bounds past the king to lick the man Colt's face. Aukus puts his arms around the dog's neck and stares defiantly at Alexander. I'm very sorry to hear about your mother, Aukus, the king says quietly. I've sent a message to your father myself. There was no need for your slave to risk his neck stealing one of our horses. Go back to Lady Barcine now. You can take Perita with you. Alexander waits until the sentry has led the man colt away and the dog away. Then he glares at his men and grooms and snaps, How did this happen? Tidios stammers, We're very sorry, your majesty, but we were asleep and the moon drunk more like it, Alexander shouts. He strides up and down the line of frightened grooms, sniffing their breath and shaking his head in disgust. Don't any of you realize this is the battle we've been heading toward ever since we left Pella? All those cities we captured, all the men who have died, all that effort was so we could come here, to the very borders of Persia, and challenge King Darius on his home ground. He has every last fighting man in his entire camp half away, half a day away. If we win this battle, the Persian army will never recover. Darius's crown will be mine and all his lands. There will be no one left to stop me from reaching the edge of the world. As the king speaks, his fists clench and unclench and little shudders go through his body. The sentries fidget, uncomfortable. Tidios looks at his feet and says nothing. Alexander draws a final, shuddering breath and presses his knuckles to his forehead. The men and grooms tense. Tidios closes his eyes, but the king sighs and lowers his fist. <sighs> when he next speaks, it's in a quieter tone. You're only grooms. You can't be expected to understand. But you're lucky that slave took the mare. If he'd stolen Bucephalus, I'd have turned the lot of you out of this camp without your hands, like that old muleteer General Parmenio tells me killed himself in Egypt because he couldn't bear to live any longer like a cripple. He pauses to let this sink in, then orders everyone back to their posts with instructions to stay alert because we are breaking camp tomorrow and going to meet Darius. There's to be no more drinking until after we've won this battle, he continues, and his lip twitch up at one corner. Then we can all celebrate. Tidios shivers at his lucky escape. He peers at the king and whispers, Are we really going to win, sir? Everyone's saying King Darius's army is much bigger than ours, and the moon went out. The other grooms and sentries creep closer to hear the king's reply. Alexander flicks a hand at the moon and laughs. My seer tells me the eclipse was a sign that Macedonia will darken the light of Persia before this month is out. It's a bad omen for Darius, but a good omen for us. As for these silly rumors about the size of King Darius's army, the prisoners we captured were probably exaggerating. Even if they weren't, one, one Macedonian is worth ten Persians. We'll get Demetrius's mare back again soon enough, don't you worry. A huge herd. Alexander might have told our grooms not to worry, but next morning in the cool time before sunrise, when he vaulted on to me, the shadows around his eyes were even deeper. He called the guard, and we galloped into the hills to take a look at the Persian army. I could tell there were strange horses ahead long before we saw them. We could hear them whinnying as their grooms gave them breakfast. I flared my nostril nostrils to catch the smells. Sweat? Smoke? Barley? Oil, men stallions, lots of mares. As we crested the ridge, my skin tightened with excitement. I filled my lungs and let out a shuddering neigh. Some of the Persian horses looked around, but most were too far away to hear me. The sun rose, huge and red, out of the haze over the plain, bringing more and more of the enemy herd into view. Most seemed to be cavalry like us, but... There were a few chariots, too. The sun flashed fire from their wheels as they drove up and down the lines and lines and lines of horses looking very tiny below us. On my back, Alexander was silent. He raised a hand to shade his eyes against the sun. His other hand held my reins so tightly I had to toss my head to tell him he was hurting my mouth. 
He trembled slightly, moved his lips as if counting under his breath, and whispered, Oh, Zeus, Hephaestion, have I made a very big mistake? Fortunately, the rest of the guard did not hear this. They, too, were staring at the army and whispering uneasily among themselves. Aeolus looked as pale as snow. Electra had joined the guard to carry Aura's rider, Demetrius. My filly was being very well behaved, considering she had the big Achilles shield resting upon her withers, but I missed my special mare. Hephaestion nudged Potassios forward until his knee touched Alexander's. He said in a professional voice, Nearly all cavalry, exactly as the Persian captives said. They have new weapons, longer spears, what looks like better armor, chariots, of course, with something on their wheels I can't quite see, blades, I think. He glanced at Alexander. We'll have to watch out for them or they'll gash the horse's legs. Alexander gave his friend a grateful look, sat up straighter and took a deep breath. Yes, it's going to be a cavalry battle, the best sort. I don't see any foot soldiers, do you? Uh, a few, Hephaestion pointed to the middle of the herd. Not many, probably only Darius's bodyguard. He glanced back at our army, which was still marching into position through the hills. What do you think, Alex? The men are rested and eager to fight. Shall we attack before the Persians wake up? The guard heard this and gathered up their reins, trying to look as if they weren't scared. Their horses had already sensed their nerves and danced closer to me. I trembled with excitement. My rider wasn't scared, of course, but he felt a little less confident than usual. Alexander shook his head and narrowed his eyes. I'm going to have to think about this. They'll outflank us easily. Their cavalry outnumbers ours at least five to one. They've been camped here long enough to have set traps. You heard what those Persian spies... Um, you heard what those Persian spies we caught said about pits and hidden stakes. I want a closer look at that ground down there. <clears throat> Hephaestion looked worried. What about General Parmenio's idea of a night attack to target and kill Darius? Alexander shook himself and made himself huge. No, my friend, no more assassinations. This battle must be won properly or not at all. I'd rather win tomorrow and have Darius escape again than kill him and leave all those Persians down there to fight me another day and with another leader. But you have King Darius's only son and heir captive. Alexander smiled. Do you really think that matters to them? Since when has legitimacy had anything to do with power? How long do you think it would take Antip um, Antipater to seize the throne of Macedonia if I were to die here today? And General Parmenio is just waiting for someone to kill me, so his son Philotus can be king. Or maybe you want to lead the army, Hephaestion, or you, Aeolus? He turned and made a playful jab at Aeolus's ribs with the shaft of his spear. The guard looked a bit alarmed. No one's going to kill you, Alex. Don't be silly, Demetrius said. They won't get close enough, and they wouldn't dare, Ptolemy added. Everyone knows you're favored by the gods. You're the son of Zeus, aren't you? said Parrot, uh, Peridic, uh, Perdiccas. And it's different for you anyway. The Persians respect their king's family. You don't have an official heir yet. Craterus should have known better than to mention that. Alexander's fist tightened on my rein and his cheeks flushed. Enough! We're wasting time. I need a cavalry escort. See to it, will you, Hephaestion? I'm going down there. I lashed my tail in Xanthus's face as we cantered down the slope, but Alexander felt determined again, and he had stopped trembling. As we trotted around that plain under the burning sun with half our cavalry as an escort and the horses of the guard close around me, Alexander grew more and more confident. We didn't find any pits with stakes, just a vast area of leveled ground with the stones removed, perfect for galloping over. I was impatient to try it out, but Alexander kept me on a tight rein and wouldn't let any of us out of a trot. Meanwhile, a small herd of Persians trotted their horses up and down nearby and called out squealing threats. Where's your great army, Queen King Exander? We only see a few boys not old enough to shave. Our great King Darius say if you go home, he send you some golden toys to keep amused. He say you should leave, to, leave war to men or we teach you hard lesson tomorrow. Alexander ignored them. 
He told the guards to pretend we were planning a night attack on the Persian camp, as General Parmenio had advised. Then he carried on surveying the plain, making notes on a piece of flattened grass balanced across my withers. Since he was obviously too busy to squeal back, I squealed at their horses to put them in their place. And every time I found a pile of Persian dung, I made sure I dominated it. When we got back to camp, Alexander disappeared into his pavilion with his notes. He turned away everyone who tried to join him, even Hephaestion. He worked through the hot afternoon and most of the night. Finally, his lamp flickered out, so I knew my rider slept at last.